Stearns pinball machines are arcade quality and built by hand outside of Chicago, Illinois. With easy setup and installation, every Stern pinball machine delivers hours of uninterrupted fun. Hello, everybody. I'm not waiting to be introduced by Gary, because I'm also Gary. My name's Gary Stern. I'm the uh, president of uh, Stern Pinball, and I appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all. But first of all, a, a little bit of housekeeping, a few uh, things, matters we have to take care of. Um, the second most important thing we'll do, I understand, when I'm done speaking, and that's to find out who gets the Tron pinball machine out here to do the drawing, which I'm sure is why I hope a few more people wander in just to see if they won or not. That's my, uh, my way to get people to come in, I guess. Um, the first most important thing is to congratulate Ka Kaylee? Yeah. Kaylee, who finally got the tournament going in, uh, in Sweden, which you guys had a little bit of trouble with. He's your world champion pinball. Yeah, and uh, congratulations very much. Um, for you, wait a minute, the best I can do right now, you get a pinball machine, but... He earned this try, right? You earned it. The best I can do right now is um, a keyphobe from, which a semi-legal keyphobe from a, a pinball Thanks journal, so pin game journal, but congratulations. Thanks so much. You know, it's, it, just to digress for a second, to us, the IFPA and the tournament play is very important. And I'll talk more about what I think has to be happening in pinball, what we're trying to do. But we, we want to support the IFPA, we hope all of you do, because this exposure and this involving more and more people in the sport of pinball, not just the amusement, we think the amusement is important in the bars and what have you, but just the sport of it is very important. That will get us out there, that will get us publicity, that will get more people interested. Some of the tournaments that they do are not just for these guys, but for uh, you know, different levels, different kind of players, and anything that you all can do to support that will support your sport, your hobby, and our pinball machines, because obviously we all love pinball. And your launch so. parties next week. And oh yes, that's right. We have launch parties next week for Tron. Little bit anticlimactic because the Tron is here, you all get to see it, but it's the only one that's out and about right now. In, uh, the, there ha we have been building it for a little while, shipping it in containers to Europe, so this is the only existing Tron out on the, out on the street right now at all. And the launch parties, there are multiple launch parties here, and they are at, somebody help me, Dorkies, I knew. And where else are we doing this? Seattle Waterfront Arcade. Seattle Waterfront Arcade. It's in the Seattle Pinball Museum. So you all please go out uh, you know, and enjoy yourselves there. Thank you. And thank, thank you, congratulations. Thanks a lot. And we'll take a couple eight by 10 glossies of that, please. Thank you. All right. So. How many people, how many people were in the tournament? Guys, how many? So he was the, the best of 64. He was the best of 64. Okay, the, uh, the Sharps here run the IFPA. Where'd you guys come in? Zach was third. Third, yeah. Zach knocked me out early. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Usually, I think they have, you know, they got it fixed or something, so they get way up there. So, any event. Um, I appreciate the opportunity, as I said, to talk to you all. I've been talking to uh, a number of uh, different events like this. Um, and some of you might have heard me speak before, so you please correct me when I lose track of where I am because then you'll know what I was supposed to be saying. But we're, you know, I'm here, you're here, we all have the same interests, we have an interest in pinball. You guys are, you guys and ladies, uh, and young ladies, are, uh, are uh, players and enthusiasts and collectors. We're, we're at Stern, we're all very interested in this business too. Yes, we make our living with it. Um, I'm 66, I should probably retire, but it's still important to me, it's interesting to me, and to all of our people, because it's not only a way of making a living, and it's an advocation. It's something that we all find very important that we do. Most of us have been doing this for a very long time. Stern Pinball is 25 years old this year. Um, it started out as Date East Pinball in uh, 86. We sold it to its parent, semi-parent company, uh, a company that owned 20% of Dadeese. Dadeese was a Japanese video game company. We ha they were our initial investors. We sold it to uh, uh, Sega, their 20% owner, in 1994. 
and I bought it from Sega in 1999. It is the same corporation. It's, we just changed the name of the corporation. Same company, 25 years old this year, and um, I may not make it around for the next 25 years, but Stern Pinball will be here for the next 25 years. It's, it, you know, it's important to all of us at Stern, as I said, making our living, but an avocation. Most of us have been in the pinball business the majority of our uh, grown-up life, uh, the majority of our business careers. Uh, our plant manager, Don Thorne, was with me at the old Stern when I bought uh, the assets of Chicago Coin in 1976. So he's been manage managing pinball factories all this time. Uh, Eddie Spears, our buyer, uh, head buyer, was the stockroom foreman at Bally. Um, you know, um, you know some of the other people. John Borg uh, came from Gottlieb. Uh, um, uh, Shelley Sachs uh, predates Stern Pinball with with me. She's been with me, you know, all that, you know, over 30 years. Uh, all these people have been around this for a long, long time. Um, and then, of course, you know, uh, uh, Lyman, and you uh, you heard David Thiel, uh, and you heard John Yowsey talk about how long they've been doing doing pinball, we're all just very, very committed to it. Um, Steve, of course, has been around for a long time. So these are all people who want to make great pinball, not just want to make a living. They want pinball to exist, they want to make great pinball, and you know we're making commercial pinball and consumer pinball. We're doing the whole thing. Now, a little bit of background on me. Uh, I'm second generation pinball manufacturer. That means that my father made pinball machines before me. My father started in uh, the 1930s as a uh, as a uh, operator, game operator, um, and um, many operators in in those. In fact, he used to stop. He used to take my mother out on dates and stop at a spot and empty the jukebox in order to have money for the dates. Uh, my uh, many many um, uh, operators in those days wanted to get games sooner. He was in Philadelphia, wanted to get games sooner and at a better price. So therefore, they became distributors. And they got games first from the factories. In 1947, Sam, that was my father, Sam Stern, he was a 35-year-old 30, punk kid. I can say that now because I'm 66. He was a 35-year-old punk kid and he came into Chicago to see his suppliers. He came in to see Harry Williams. Uh, of the Williams Pinball Company, who was probably, give or take, a 39-year-old punk kid. And he sat, Sam sits behind Harry's desk, puts his feet up on the desk and says, kidding around, just a joke, why don't you sell me the company? So Harry says, I'll have to go up in my airplane and think about that. So in 1947, Harry had a little Bonanza airplane, that's the one with the V-tail, flew around Chicago for three hours, came down and show, sold my father. Uh, uh, half, half of the Williams company. So we've been pinball manufacturers since I was two years old. I was two at the time. Um, I've been around it all my life. I, I started, you know, I, I was, I'd go to the factory on the weekends when you know, my father worked and play with the little switchblades and everything and make a mess of everything. Uh, my little desk at home, instead of homework, I'd pull out the drawer and I'd rearrange my pop bumper caps and posts and things like that. She had all the little toys and you know they, they, they were very colorful. It was cute. Um, so you know, been around it all that time. Finally, started doing real work uh, in. Um, um, when I was, I don't know when that was, when I was 16, let's see, it was a long time ago. In the summer, I, I worked in the stock room, uh, in, in, my father started me in the stock room because pinball is a manufacturing business. You know, I, design is great, all that's very important. We manufacture something. We're American manufacturers of something. And we manufacture a pretty complex product, actually. There's uh, 3,500 pieces in a pinball machine over half a mile of wire. Um, more uh, man hours than in, in, in the Ford Taurus that used to be built in, not far from our factory by more man hours. I mean, it takes us about 32 hours to build a pinball machine, all the labor, all the people in it. And that's, that's four man days per pinball machine. That's a little bit more than in, in a uh, uh, Ford Taurus. Uh, automobile that used to be manufactured around, uh, around us. So he started me in the stock room because it is so, the material control is so important in pinball. That's, you know, if, if, if we can't make a profit, we don't have a, pin, a pinball company. And um, 
So uh, if, you, if you can't control the material, that 3,500 pieces, that half mile of wire, then you're not gonna make pinballs. You're gonna make poor quality pinballs, you're gonna lose money. If you don't have the parts when you need them, everybody, all those 32 hours of workers, those four people per, day, per machine are standing around doing nothing. If we're gonna make 30 machines a day, that's 120 people standing around doing nothing, getting paid, you know? Give or take, what's that, uh, 1,500, $2,000 an hour, <laughs> just gone. If you don't have the parts, you can't make the games. If you, if you buy too many of the parts, there goes your profit, because you got parts left over at the end that what are you gonna do with? So that's where he started me, uh, out, out in the stock room, and he moved me around to various places. Other, and I've been around these pinball factories, a, a number of them, you know, for, for way too many years. Um, any event, um, Josh will probably tell you I'm off my script right now, so I'm gonna take a look and see, see, see where we are. Um, we're doing things you know, uh, differently, and I want to tell you what we're trying to do. Um, we've, we've made some changes in, in what we're doing, and we're going to talk about, a little bit about who we're trying to reach, what we're trying, trying to do. We have to do things differently than we did 10 years ago, five years ago, 20 years ago. You know, we had to you know, think through what was going on, and, and, and I usually use at this point the, uh, uh, the Einstein definition of insanity, and that's that if, we, you know, it, 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 that if you continue doing what you've been doing and expect a, a different result, that's the definition of insanity. Um, so we've changed, we have to change what we're doing or this whole thing's gonna blow up. We're not gonna have, have, have a business anymore. So, so the first thing we had to think about is how are we gonna continue this? You notice I mentioned that I'm 66. So we have to both change what we're doing and plan for succession. So one of the things I did is I uh, brought in a partner, uh, Dave Peterson, he's a venture capitalist. That means he puts money in businesses and helps them to restructure themselves and to continue. We needed some more money to get through the Lehman Brothers recession. We did. And we rest we're restructuring ourselves. Um, and, and Dave and his guys are helpful and are, are not employees but are involved in, in the business in, in, in helping us make some changes, which we'll talk about, and restructure the type of things that we're doing. To, to have better systems, we have to update our systems. You know, we've been doing the same thing in pinball, our company, for roughly 25 years, and a lot of that adapted from Williams and Stern Electronics before it. So we have to relook and say, what can we do different? You know, how, how are we gonna re, re, rebuild all this thing? We also have to, you know, we survived the, 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 the recession, as I said. I'm making the assumption the recession is over. It is, we're coming out of, or we're getting a little bit better. So we have to restructure ourselves. We have to, we, we had shrunk ourselves down. We had to add some people back and add some quality people. Uh, Lyman Sheets came, uh, came back and rejoined us. Steve Ritchie, you've seen here, rejoined us. And we have plans for, for uh, more growth and, and staff enhancements uh, as we go along. We've also, you've noticed, you guys pro probably especially more than I have, that we've done a lot more marketing, a lot more trying to find out what to do in the marketplace, a lot more social networking. Uh, and many of you have seen uh, Jody Dankberg's work uh, either on, the, on Facebook or at these launch parties or what have you. And what you guys you know, have said to us, we've listened to it, uh, Game like Tron, this is a title that I might not normally have picked, but the game community wanted that title. You guys wanted that title, and that's why that title's here. And, um, and your reception of it uh, has been very good, and we very much appreciate that. Um, the, um, uh, with all of this, we continue to look at our market and have to decide what it is that you know, we want to do, who our market is. We, we have different segments of the market that we are, we're dealing with, different, different buyers, different market segments. And basically, um, we have um, three segments that, we, we, that, we, that we're selling to, three different buyers three customer groups. I call it, you know, that we're like uh, farmers milking a cow, we have a three-legged stool. We need all three of those legs, all three of those segments. In the segments, we, we make games for operators to 
operate in, in, in bars, in, in street locations, in, in arcades, what have you. We make games you know, for all different kind of street uh, and, and arcade operation. Very important part of our business. More than half of our business is to operators, and you might not under think that when you look around this country, but I'll explain that a little more. We make games for, uh, for pinball enthusiasts. So that's the next leg for you guys, the collectors, enthusiasts, what have you. And we make games for just general homeowners. I describe it as rich doctors and lawyers, but it's really many, many different people who may be rich, may not be rich, but want to have a game in their home. You know, there's a lot more home entertainment than there used to be, uh, and, uh, and uh, people are staying at home, they're needing more things. They don't necessarily have room for a pool table, which is not as much fun as a pinball machine anyways, but takes a lot of space with four foot around that uh, pool table. You need a big room to put it in. Pinball machine works real nice in the home. Now, a lot of, you know, everybody who wants, you know, in these different uh, 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 segments have a little bit different purpose, maybe need a little bit something different, but there's, there's similarities to it. And again, we look at the world market. We are exporting 60% of our pinball machines, 60% outside of the US today. And that may be higher because the dollar is so weak, but that's the case right now and it's very important to us. We need that 60%, of course. That 60% is mostly game operators. 10% of our games last year were sold to France. France has almost no home sales. Our customer doesn't make the home sales. They sell just to game operators. Eight, nine percent of our pinball machines are sold to Italy. Now, Italy has a very active, as does France, a very active uh, uh, IFPA community, uh, very active enthusiast community, but they don't buy a lot of new pinball machines. Our distributor in uh, Italy is uh, Technoplay, which belongs to the Zachariah family. You all know Zachariah Pinball, or you should know it. It's one of the great old pinball machine companies. And uh, they tell me, Marino tells me that 99.5% of his sales are to operators. That's their business there. So the operation of the pinball machines, that part of the business is very, very important to us. Again, probably, well, certainly over half of our pinball machines are, um, are sold to, uh, to game operators. Other countries, a little bit different, you might find interesting. In Australia, probably half our games, maybe even more than half our games, are sold to homeowners, often enthusiasts. Uh, in Northern Europe, there's a lot of enthusiast purchase, homeowner purchase of uh, pinball machines more than operators. Part of that's because there's so much soft gambling in these areas. What I mean soft gambling, it's AWP, amusement with prizes, low stakes in slot machines, uh, uh, you know, the low stakes in low payout, high frequency of pay. You see these all over Europe except for France, different versions of them. So any event, you know, we, we, we have in our export market all three legs of the stool, more of the operator leg, and, uh, and uh, maybe a little more of the enthusiast leg, less of the doctor lawyer leg. In this country, we have maybe a little less operator leg and we want to uh, in, improve on that. Um, probably, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a good enthusiast leg and a real upside in the, in the general homeowner or what I call the doctor lawyer leg. Now, talked about the games, you know, we, we, we need to have all three of these legs. And the coin-op leg, I believe, is very important, not only because it's over half our business, but I think that if we don't have coin-op pinball machines, that, again, not in my business career, maybe not in your collecting time, probably in your collecting time, pinball machines won't be cool anymore. If you never see a pinball machine in a television ad, or, which you won't if they're not in the street or in the street or in a bowling alley or this or that, all of a sudden it doesn't become cool. You know, for you guys it'll be cool, but for anybody else coming up, it's not gonna be cool if there's not some contact with it, some, some reality, sense of reality to this thing's not just, you know, it's, we're not making horse and buggies. 
we're making pinball machines, if we were making, people collect cars, they don't collect horse and buggies. They collect cars because they're cool. Horse and buggies aren't. When was the last time you drove by a McMansion with the, and the, all four garage doors opened up and there were four horses and buggies in there? There were cool cars in there. Well, the same thing's true of the pinball machine. If it's not something that's out there in the general public, it's not gonna be cool as a collectible anymore. And it's not gonna be cool for that doctor or lawyer anymore. You know, the, the doctor or lawyer is buying it because it's cool, because it, it, it's making a statement. He's gonna, he's gonna play that, by the way, I keep saying doctor and lawyer, and I can say that because although I don't practice, I'm, I'm still licensed for a few more months as a lawyer. So I, I understand this part of it. I'm not trying to be insulting to doctors and lawyers. Um, but the, you know, the, he, he's got that pinball machine at home, and it's, it's as much an art form or an American icon as anything else. He's got something cool. Now to get that pinball machine, any big ticket item that, that other than you guys, that most of us would buy for the house, we have to tell mommy, because everything going in the house is mommy's choice. We, have to, we want a great big screen TV, anything like that. We have to tell mommy it's for the kids. So part of the way we sell pinball machines to that third leg is that they have to be for the you know for family entertainment for the whole for the whole group so we need all three of the legs we have to see what do we got to do for, to satisfy each segment we need that operator we need him to make money and our pinball machines weren't making money because they weren't fun for a lot of people we found that um, pinball machine became this this is what happens in all game design the, it's hard to do with something in your hand because I have to do my hands, use my hands. But in all game design, the, uh, the players get better so the designers make the game more difficult, more complex. So the player gets better. Make it more complex. Player gets better, make it more complex. This player stays home. Whole new crop of players out there. And they don't think this is fun. These games became so complex that the great players had, you know, had these really deep rules and we're playing for 45 minutes. Now, I don't think, say we shouldn't have deep rules, but maybe not linear deep rules where you go through the whole thing. This time you go through this deep rules, this time this deep rules, but this, with these games would play for 45 minutes, the great player would play it once, one credit, didn't have to play again. I'd play for 45 seconds, one credit, didn't want to play again. The game could make a buck an hour. We're not gonna have pinball machines out on the street if we can only make a buck an hour. We had a pinball machine, our English customer sent us in a uh, Gottlieb game, a, um, a spinner card. And across my office there was a room and, and Lyman and, and Keith was with us at the time, so Lyman would play against Keith, two great players. Lyman would play the, the pinball machine while Keith would be in his office programming. Lyman's ball would drain after 10 minutes, whatever, 15 minutes. He'd go back to, to Lyman's office. As he walked by, Keith would see. He'd come, and he'd play for 10 or 15 minutes. They never played the game, and the, they were never in the same office at the same time playing the game because it played so long and so skillfully. It was 90% skill, 10% randomness. We brought in uh, this Gottlieb game, spin a card, and all of a sudden, both guys are in there playing the game and swearing at it. And, and, and once in a while, I played, and I got once in a while a ball that you know, put me in competition that I could do something, something with. So what we figured out, and Lyman figured out, that okay, these games were 90%, 10%. This spin a card was 50-50, half skill, half chance. As Harry Williams used to say, the ball is wild. We lost that. When we did Big Buck Hunter, we did it with, uh, with Raw Thrills, with Eugene Jarvis, with uh, Play Mechanics, George Petro, and one of the guys who works at Play Mechanics is a great pinball designer, Mark Ritchie, and they came over and they, you know, it was licensed from them, and we changed the design concept. 
We changed the design concept to have more randomness, magnets throwing the ball around. You know, we, use, we, we used to use the white rubbers on pinball machines that are softer, they get dirty. We went to black rubbers that were harder and they'd last longer. We now have black rubbers in most places, black rubbers that are softer, more randomness, bounce the ball around, a little less control for you guys, but a little bit more fun for everybody else. So any event, with their help, we were able to change our design concept direction, our design philosophy, to have more randomness and have more fun for everybody, still have something for the great players. Now, if you look at our games since Buck Hunter, you'll see that that's what we've been doing. You look at Iron Man, Avatar, Stones, and now Tron, we're moving in that direction. The games have, have, have a, you know, a little bit more stuff to understand, a little bit more instruction for the casual player. They play shorter. We had, um, was it your group that came over, Josh? We had a group of his club or whatever you want to call it, club? Pinball League. league. This Pinball League, instead of playing at somebody's house, played in, in our factory, Iron Man. Nobody had a game, now this may sound long for a, for a game operator, nobody played a game over 10 minutes. Not, no 45 minute games. So, you know, that's the concept of what we're trying to do. I tell you this because I want you to understand what we're trying to do and what we've done with these games and see how that might make sense. You know, I want you to understand what we're doing. You may not agree with it, but understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, and, you know, then you can have constructive criticism of what we're doing because you know why we're trying to do it. Now, you know, it, it also, you'll notice that the games have more open play fields. Maybe a little less stuff on it, a little less to break, uh, but also things where people have some, you know, can understand, the casual player can understand better what to do. Again, all game design is trying to do the same thing. I don't care if it's slot machines in Las Vegas, AWPs in England, Wii games, whatever. Trying to broaden the player base by, by getting more casual players interested in the game. If we can't broaden the player base, then we're going to lose, lose our op operations. We'll lose an you know, important leg to our a segment, to our stool. So we have to get all of that in. Now, how does that apply to other people? To the doctor lawyer who bought that pinball machine and put it in his house, some of these games were, he had no idea what to do. His friends had come over, well, what am I supposed to do? How do I play this? I don't know. How about you hit the ironmonger? You know, there's something they can figure out. They can have some fun playing the game, even though they're going to stop, you know, they're going to play it, as I said, you know, uh, for three weeks, and then they're going to play it at halftime during the Super Bowl after the band's done. Um, but at least they'll have some understanding. They'll have some fun. They'll know what they're doing. Maybe they'll buy another pinball machine. They'll understand it, and maybe their kids will play it. I've talked to some in, of the enthusiasts, you know, uh, what I call the enthusiast group, the collectors, whatever, and some of them have also said that there's something to be said for these games that don't play 45 minutes. We had a tournament at Starburst, our, our distributorship, in, uh, we've had it two years now in, uh, in Canada, and I mean, the finals, the games would go on for an hour and a half, one guy against another. Len, the owner, was about to pull the plug and say, you know, if this is going on, I can't stay any longer. I'm paying these people to stand here and watch these two guys play, and it's not even fun to watch. You, know, you have your, you know, you you have your leagues in the in, in the basement. Uh, do you have guys have basements in Seattle? Yeah. Well, I, you know, some some states don't have basements. The family room has to be next door, um, or or in the garage or something like that. So you have your you know your, your your league in the basement. One guy's playing the game for 45 minutes. The other three guys are eating Cheetos. You know, I mean, is it really fun? Versus if you can really compete with each other. You know, have the game start and end in some reasonable time frame so you can play another game. You know, years ago, we made puck bowl, or shuffle alleys, and they're not popular today, but they were very popular only on the East Coast and in Chicago. I don't know why. And I went to, in Chicago, I went to New York to see our, our distributor there. A shuffle alley has five modes, uh, five different ways to play the game. Regulation, scoring, flash, super flash, you know, usually two other ones. So our distributor there says to me, you should make one of those six frame games. And so his name was Al Dianzella, worked for uh, Al Simon. I said, Al, what are you nuts? Who's gonna pay a quarter 
to pl play six frames when for a quarter they could have 10 frames. And he said, guys who want to play for two beers at lunch. They can get two games in during their lunch break instead of one. Made a lot of sense. Well, the same thing's true here. These pinball machines play for very long when they were 90% skill. A little bit of chance, a little bit of the ball as wild as Harry said, a little bit of randomness is what we're trying to add here. And it may apply to all of these markets. Now, having said that, one size does not fit all. You know, I've talked about market segment, segmentation. You know, the two, three different segments of the market. The, the operator, the enthusiast, the general homeowner. Sometimes we need something different for them. So it's product differentiation. Instead of making the same game for everybody, which is what we've done all these years, what we now call the pro, which is what this game out here is, we now sometimes, with some models, make a premium, maybe a limited edition premium, a game that's got a little bit more going on, on on it, a little bit more eye candy, a little bit more bells and whistles, maybe a little more rules, uh, a little bit uh, more mechanical parts, a little bit more features. We have, you know, the, the Pro Tron is out here. We will start making the uh, limited edition version of Tron, which are all ordered from the factory. Um, I don't know if all our customers have sold them all. Uh, I, Mike McWilliams out here says all of his are sold. Um, so they, they have a little bit more on them. And for those of you who don't know, they have, I have to read this. Th they're numbered. One of 400, two of 400, three of 400, just like fine art, because they are fine art. Um, they have a motorized recognizer, which you, those of you who saw the presentation, uh, the uh, video by, uh, of, of John Borg yesterday saw that, uh, that device, and there's some rules that relate to it, and some inserts, uh, lighted inserts, control lamps that relate to it. Um, it's got the, uh, the um, fiber optic illumina luminescent tubes that go around the ramps that, and change colors and, and follow the ball path. Rules that go along with that. The four bank stand up target, the, the Tron target is replaced with a, with a four bank drop target. Um, the control lights are LEDs and that means the light shows and the whole look of it is, is quite different. The LEDs are fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Um, um, the, there's a little bit extra art on the play field. Uh, so we've done this before with the silver screen and augmenting the art. Um, the, uh, and then it's got the chrome package, the, uh, the lights in the, in the bottom arch, the scorecard holder, um, the, uh, uh, the uh, foot molding latch and uh, play field supports uh, the other, the, the, of the uh, slide type. So it has a lot of different stuff on it, a lot of additions, additions to it. Again, one, you know, one size doesn't fit all, so we're trying to differentiate the product to, to meet the, the, the demand of uh, different, uh, uh, different segments of the market. But, but again, we're looking at this business and, and what, what it wants, what it can do, what the customers want. They want Tron, they want a different, different kind of game, they need a different kind of game for operation, and maybe a different kind of game for home. We're looking at the kind of play that type of thing. The other thing, the, the, the last thing that we're looking, we looked at is, um, is sales channels. And we sold our games just through game distributors. Some of them have done a wonderful job of, of uh, uh, get, reaching the different segments of the market. Um, especially coin here, uh, uh, being one of the ones that has. Some of them have not, and we have to say, well, how do we get our product out to the different segments of the market? For game operators, the best way is through distributors. For homeowners, or for enthusiasts, uh, maybe it's distributors, maybe it's some specialty sellers of pinball machines in, who, who specialize in selling to you all. For general homeowners, again, maybe it's our distributors. Maybe it's other game retailers. Maybe it's uh, uh, the billiard store. Maybe it's a mass merchant. 
We're trying different channels to get pinball machines out to different people. Three different segments, one, two different product differentiation, uh, one size doesn't fit all, different channels in which to, uh, to um, uh, dis distribute and sell the games through. And again, overall, changing the design philosophy to make a game that should be more fun for everybody by broadening the player, uh, player base and making it fun for casual people and not pure, pure, pure skill, but again, making, calling, you know, it, 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 as Harry would say, the ball is wild. Now, that's what we're doing. Um, oh, and again, as I started out with, and normally I have this in the middle, but we did it first, more cooperation work with the IFPA which I think is very, very important, and I again encourage all of you to do whatever you can in that respect. Now, what can I ask you all to do? Because I'm going to, I have to, and some of you have heard this before. If pinball is just in the home, we're going to lose it. It's a social game. You know, some people play just against the game, you know, just one, and one on one, but generally it's a social game. You guys have your leagues, it's a social game. And I, you know, I asked that, and this is maybe the wrong city to ask it in because you do have games in locations here, in a few locations, but some of you aren't from here. There are games, and some of you are, and there's more locations. You know, take your league out of the house and go to a location and say, we will put seats in the stools. In other words, we'll come and drink your beer. We'll put seats in the stools. If your operator will put a pinball machine or two pinball machines in here. You know, one new one, one old one, whatever it might be. He may be receptive to that. If not, the guy down the street may be. Certainly doesn't hurt to ask. If he may find that his operator doesn't want to do it, but his operator might not care enough about the pinball, and I've seen this happen, might let one of you do it, you know, where you rotate your pinball machines in, in and out of there. Well, that's sort of what's going on down in uh, uh, at, uh, Dorky's, isn't it, to some extent? You know, you guys have pin, some of you all have the pinballs in, the, in there, I guess, or somebody does. Very, very interesting. Uh, I, I know near our factory in Chicago, uh, somebody who's got the pinball machines in a bar in, in Berwyn, the operator let, you know, lets them do that. So, you know, one way or another, you know, you guys can help us have pinball machines in locations. I think it's very important. Um, I think that pinball machines, uh, you know, I need to back up here. We changed the design philosophy, and you've heard people say pinball can't make money. Well, it's not true. Our design philosophy, the games are playing shorter. You can't make money with a game that's playing 45 minutes. You can with a game that's playing three minutes average, and our reports from our customers in France, from customers in Minnesota, from wherever it might be, it, from here, the games are making more money. It will work. It will work. Well, you know, it, it's, it's not the end all to everything. We still have a ways to go to f try new things as we try and get the games to make more money. But you guys can help by doing that. The other thing I ask is it, it, to everybody when I do this is to post on our website where games are. You guys probably have your own out here uh, website that you do that with. But you know, the, both when you go somewhere else, you can look up games, and when people come here, they can look up games. So I ask that you do that, that you keep our website up to date with where different pinball machines are. Now, I didn't do any of my speech because we started off somewhere different. It got, I covered most of it. Did I get most of it? OK, I'm fair today. You're ready to get the social game with you. Huh? No, I got it, huh? I got it? Okay, okay. He's heard, he's heard me before. I didn't, I'm on page uh, five of nine pages. I didn't read any of it. Oh, well. But um, I more or less, you know, I, I get, you know, I've made the points that I'm trying to make here. And, and, and again, different segments, different channels, product differentiation, and the design philosophy that has more randomness in it, a little bit less skill, because the ball is wild. So with that, we'll see if you all got any questions. They would like you to go to the microphone. I will do my best with this.
<laughs> so what I, what I think the Tron pinball thing needs for the premium, have an actual game going on the small, have an actual screens on the small arcade thing and have more of the original soundtrack by Daft Punk on the, on the game. It's very interesting in, in, in that as far as a video game, the have the, the have let's see have screens that shift yeah. like showing you do stuff it shows different areas. Yeah. There's a certain amount that we can do and we can't do, you know, practically and 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 and, and the game is is done. So it, it's, it, we know what it's going to be. But as the video game, we're limited into what we can do. And some of this was touched on uh, yesterday in talking about Tron. Nobody knows. I don't know why. Nobody knows who owns the Tron video game. To me and my lawyer, it's very clear that it belongs to Disney because all the copyrights, everything is in Disney's name. Disney doesn't think they own it. They don't know who owns it. I said, but wait a minute, you own it. Well, maybe we do, maybe we don't. We can't take a chance. We don't know. I said, what do you mean you don't? I don't understand this. It's their video game. They don't, so we couldn't use the video game, the original 1982 video game per se. What we licensed was Tron Legacy. So that's what we could use. What they would let us do was Tron Legacy and things that we created, and of course we, you know, we bought music, as you know, uh, but the video game is just somewhere in the ether. I don't know. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, hi, Gary. Uh, my name is John Robertson. Um, some of you may know me as JR at flippers.com on, on Rec Dog Games at Pinball. I've been uh, an operator, a somewhat distributor, and most of our business is home sales. And I've got a couple of questions for you. Um, one of the things we do is film rentals and licensing. Licensing has become a bit of a problem lately. Uh, if you have any friends at Williams and some of the other manufacturers, if they can loosen up a little bit. Say uh, that again. What, what, which is the problem? Licensing. Licensing of. We did, we did Tron, uh, like we, we provide props. And so we did uh, props for Tron. We did props for, um, oh, what was it? Um, uh, the. Oh, Anyways, oh, wait, wait. A number okay. of movies. Okay. And we do, so you we supply do games, games, games to, movies. to the Yeah. To movies. And Got movies, it. Movies, okay. television shows, everything uh -huh. else. We're sure, in Vancouver, sure. so we sure. get the Hollywood yeah. North. Yeah, sure. And we're always looking for ways to make it easier for them, the props people, to put games in. Mm -hmm. uh, Atari, for example, was insane. They wanted uh, $3,000 per game, per license. So Tron has no Atari games in it, uh, unlike the real uh, arcades of that period. We'd like to get more pinballs in, but there's been a bit of a hang up with, uh, with some of that, which we're work, trying to work on to get some clarification. Um, so if there's, all I'm saying is when you're chatting with your friends in the various areas, uh, just tell them to keep loose, allow games to be put on so is, know, is the problem, licensing. Uh, yeah, it, it's the with lawyers, with, it's with, the lawyers. But is the problem with Williams? Games Williams or? seemed to be a problem because we had a, a recent rental. They wanted to get a number of our games to put on on set. You and have any problem? William, with, they yeah. couldn't get okay. for whatever reason. They couldn't get clearance from Williams, and Williams said there wasn't a problem. And because I phoned Williams to find out, and they said we don't know what the problem is. But huh. there's a little confusion with licensing. So Interesting. Is there any? Pro you don't have any problem with our games. Not that I know okay. of, but it's, there aren't a lot of your games, and I really like yeah. the direction you're taking now, okay. uh, because yeah, we tried uh, Elvis and didn't like the game, and we, as a fact, as a matter of fact, weren't carrying stern pinballs, but we will now. I'm going to get I'm going to get a Tron for Great. a shop, Good. that sort of thing, because you've now you appear to have picked up on that what yeah. people were talking about. Um, another quick question: You're talking about um, where you're selling the games through. The part, part of the problem that I see as a, small sh as a small shop is that, well, you sell them through the big box stores, they can't fix the damn things. We, first of all, so how do you, we, we, how do they deal with you're, that? You're that in was, Canada, so you're in a whole different place. You're in yeah, another country. I know. Okay? <laughs> we don't sell any big box stores in Canada. <laughs> well, we um, see that in the States, and we wonder, you know, how are you guys fixing those machines down um, there? We, what we do 
is because is we have an 800 number. You all know. Uh, oh, I know that one. We know call you guys. Chaz and Chaz and, and Pat. When when there's a problem with the game, we have a network of operators and distributors. We pay them if we have to, all if right. it's our responsibility to go out and take care of it. Uh, once again, most games sold by the big box guys are doctors and lawyers who play very little. Okay, so they're going to run. Um, some because uh, uh, what the route used to be is the operator would buy the game, they'd run it through the route, and then they'd sell it off to the homes. That's and still small shops like ours would maintain the games, and we'd buy them from the operators, fix them up. I mean, there's a bunch of guys here I know who do the same pattern. thing. It's still a great pattern. You know, that's and a great, that, that's a that's great business works. plan. Works and great. You're putting games out that people are going to want to play in the arcades because my gal was with me today, and she was trying a number of various games. She didn't get to Tron, but. And some of the games, like you say, the rule sets are too deep. She'd play one or two games, ugh, I don't like this game. Go to another game, and you get like games like Pinbot or Counterforce, which was a great sleeper game from Godlieb. Um, and those are the games that appeal to the crowds, and I like, I'm like. i really pleased to see you're making them again. You so. see, your, your point's very well taken, and that's exactly, you know, our, our, <laughs> my customer from England, again, who lent us the Gottlieb game, he said, look, my kids who are bar age, they don't play pinball, they don't know what to do. They don't know what to do on it, and he's in the game business. And it's, he's a, it's John Shergidis, you know, you, you know he, knows, he knows games. His kids can't play, can't play these games. They're not interested. Now we have their interest. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Gary. I don't know if you addressed this earlier because I missed a little bit, but. Oh, um, well then you gotta come back from the beginning. I'm gonna do okay. it again in 20 minutes. Okay. Um, are you, I heard rumors that the, you were gonna be releasing possibly a Star Trek theme. Is that true? <laughs> um, we, we've made Star Trek before. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, you like the title? Yeah, I have. Uh, I are have the Trekkies, the are the Trekkies the still around? Next generation. They still have the Trekkie conventions they, and stuff they like still that. Do yeah. Do they? <laughs> Afraid so. <laughs> yeah. What is it? What? Trekkie conventions next week? No. Oh, you don't know. You're just saying that. Um, it's an interesting question, which I wouldn't answer anyways. But thank you. <laughs> you know, very honestly, we don't we don't talk about the future games. We talk about what we have now. Listen, you, you know, we have to sell what we have now. For one, we want you to play what we have now, and you know, we have various games in the pipeline, various titles. Um, it's way too noisy out there uh, as to what they are. We'd like it to quiet down a little bit and not be, you know, where everybody knows everything we're doing. We're a design company. You know, you, you got to have a couple, couple secrets because we're doing, you know, it's not like we're doing one pinball machine a year or something. We're doing four new models a year, three and a half new models a year, three one year, four the next. We're remaking some of the old games. We have to keep this going every day. Every day there's people in that factory who want to get a paycheck and buy some food and eat and things like that. We don't have the luxury of saying, all right, this is the game we're going to work on now and we'll worry about the next one later. It's all overlapped. Everything's going, you know, at the same time. Uh, first off, thanks for uh, bringing out Tron to the show. I think it's, it's a great game and it's really Thank good, you. so I want to say thanks. I'm glad uh, you enjoy it. A uh, question I have for you, maybe a little bit about the future uh, of pinball a bit. Uh, one thing I've noticed with pinball machines is, you know, you get a good score, you put your initials in, and that's where it stays. It stays on location. Uh, it'd be really cool maybe to have a little keypad, a pin number, even maybe a card system where your scores could be tracked. It could upload to Facebook or Twitter and really bring in that social aspect uh, and kind of bring more of a community focus into pinball. Any thoughts on that? A lot of thoughts on it, and, and yes. And uh, it's, it's, there's so many things that we need to do. Uh, to improve the product and to improve the so again it's a social game and we we've done you know the Facebook type social networking and so and I got to tell you I my daughter yeah. made our first Facebook page just because she wanted people to her friends to vote uh, she wanted us to make um, oh God it was a TV show that was great that's gone off the air it was ending lost lost, lost wasn't it I think it was lost um, so she started the Facebook page and now Jody's took it over and I think finally has control of it from her, I'm not sure. Um, but that's the, uh, the first thing that, uh, that, you know, that, that maybe we did in social networking. We need to have the machines talk and what have you. One of the things I would love to have done with uh, Buck Hunter but didn't happen and maybe still may, you know, I wanted to do Buck Hunter for a number of reasons. I wanted 
people operating pinball machine, video games to maybe try a pinball machine. Well, okay. I wanted to work with Eugene and, and George. I wanted our people to work with Eugene and George and, and Mark, and Mark Ritchie and so forth. That happened and, and helped us get that, the, the uh, spinner card and everything, change our design concept. Um, the third thing I would love to have done, and we never got around to it, is plug our pinball machine into their video game that's online. But we're not there yet. We know we have to do something like that. We know we have to get the social networking. But we're, you know, and, and we really, we've had Sprint in, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's, we, we have a pretty full plate redoing what we've got. And then we have to get to that. It is on our list. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty high up on the list. But you're absolutely right. Has to be. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. I just have the most awesome idea ever. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Yes. I have, I have two short, well, maybe not short, but two questions. Um, one, are there any new technologies, not talking about the social networking and the, that kind of thing, but just for the pinball experience itself that are, I mean, that you foresee coming, for instance, even just in the, the display. I mean, I know it's been a black and white display for years now with the same size and everything. I mean, maybe just throw up an LCD or something, but anything like that. And second, this thing you were talking about earlier where you're having a bit more luck in the games, that's great, and that's a good idea for, for things, but how, do you see any conflict between that and what you were saying about competitive play being really important? Do you think that it, having a little bit more luck would make it less of a sport? Um, okay. Um, first, technology. Um, yeah, we're looking at different displays, LCDs, all this. What are you going to put up on that LCD? Uh, and, and, and what happens with, you know, we do license titles, but we have to find something different. We've been using the same, it's not black and white, it's orange and black display for some time. We have 13 shades of orange in our display. And so yes, we are looking at different things there. We're also looking at, you know, as I said, the, uh, the uh, limited edition of Tron has control lamp LCD, uh, LEDs. We did that with, which means they won't burn out. Uh, besides looking cool, we've done that with our, uh, we, may, we, we, you all know that many of you know we did what we call our classic, a, a stripped down version of, of uh, Iron Man. Just, it just wasn't cheap enough to really make a retail, retail game. Um, that had LEDs, we're looking at that type of thing. Um, you, guys, you guys trick your games out like guys did hot rods in the 50s and a lot of that's LEDs. Um, we have new, you know, different type of electronics that will be more reliable and let us do some more things with it. Um, and so there is, there's the basic technology, you know, the basic board system that we have right now goes back to, um, well, it's, it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's no longer written in assembly. It's, a, you know, a, you know in, in, it's a modern small processor but it's still you know, the same uh, matrix uh, system that we had. So we have things to do in that respect. Skill versus a um, um, little bit of randomness. Uh, pinballs, you know, again, you guys may disagree with me. The IFPA may disagree with me. Pinball is a ball and bat game, like many ball and bat games. Balls spin. Balls do different things. You know, uh, there's always some chance, I, you know, those of you who are, you know, golfers or, or, or play, play, I don't know what kind of ball, there's different, there's different random things that happen. Um, there's, a, there's a rock in the, in, 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 in the green, you know, different things happen. And so there's some randomness in all sports. There's some randomness in games. There should be, unless it's a video game. I mean, if you want a purely skilled pinball machine, purely skill, then play a video simulation because there's no randomness. They're set, you know? It's, it's, it's just what it is. So I don't think so. I don't know if, does the IFPA have any position? No, I think that what we've seen is, since the new flop, that, <laughs> I make these, I think uh, these guys are important to what we're doing. I would say, that's loud, since the new philosophy change, people who play competitive pinball will play it on anything. What we need to make sure is that it's not the same 10 people out here playing, you know, we look around and we're playing each other and that's it. The best way for us to try to get more people to play is to give them a better chance of winning. 
And when you reduce the skill, as, as Gary was talking about the ball being wild, it becomes a lot more about trying to control the chaos versus I'm going to play for an hour and a half and you're going to play for an hour and 15 and I'm going to beat you because I'm better and that's just the way it is. There's a unique challenge now with his new design philosophy and you'll see it out there in the classics bank where there's people that are avoiding the new games. Not quite sure why. They're bastardized to hell so anyone has a chance to win. But those kind of people are people that we're looking to bring back to new pinball. How about in Michigan, what we had in the tournament there? We had all the, the non-regular players in the tournament. Michigan, remember Michigan? I was there, yeah. yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> I was told, which I guess maybe I'm wrong, that, that they had the tournament there, and it wasn't the normal, you know, guys that uh, died. Oh, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> so, at least for, for events that we run, it's very important. Like, we, we've teamed up with GameWorks to run six or seven tournaments in Chicago and then at the Columbus location. May it rest in peace. But for us, it was really important to have at least 50% of our players be first-time players. And what John Cosmo was able, able to do at Michigan was bring pinball to new people in the Detroit area. and. You know, being there and being able to play against, you know, not only the same three or four people that I see every day, to see that they had a youth tournament with 70 kids that were going crazy, that's the kind of promotion that needs to be done on games that are easier for people to understand because the patience of, you know, my niece and nephew who are 10 and 8, if they don't get it within the first three minutes, they will just do something else. They're, it's not worth the challenge to them where maybe, you know, my, I'm 31. It was worth, you know, spending the time to try to figure something out, maybe because there were less options to do, but today I think the attention span is just not there. So I think he is catering to that new attention span, make people understand, and it's one of those minute to learn, lifetime to master sort of thing with, with the way the chance and skill is sort of I definitely altered. agree with making it more discoverable. That's, that's not in question for sure. I'm done. Here you go. <laughs> I make everybody work, it's okay. Thank you. Uh, hi Gary, um, I have a question. What does it cost to manufacture a pinball machine, say POTC, from design to full production? If you mean the, the, the not the game, cost game itself, but what's it cost to design a pinball yes. machine? If, figuring the people that are involved in it and all that. The licensing. The, and the licensing, the uh, $100,000 plus of artwork that's involved, and, and David back there, and so forth. Eh, give or take three quarters of a million bucks, probably. Really? Wow. Yeah. And what is the average uh, production run on, say, a game like that, or any of your yeah, other games? The whole thing has changed. The whole thing has changed. And, and you know, it used to be, <laughs> an industry of volume overcoming all the evils. We, in 1993, there were 194, we were in two and three, two years there, there were 100,000 machines a year being made by on five different uh, uh, brand names. So Gottlieb, Bally, uh, Williams, uh, Data East, or Sega, whoever we were at the time, Data East, and Capcom was trying to get, it, get in there. Um, you know, we're, we're we're at five thousand plus and going 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 up, uh, and you know by making a different game by looking at the different segments we were all coin up in those days all kind of coin up, but the game world operation has changed and the, those of you who heard some of the earlier seminars heard people talking about I mean there's no smoking laws which are wonderful things for people's health unless you're a bartender because you're healthier if you get tips. And if you don't, uh, but other than that, it's a wonderful thing for people's health, but not for game earnings. In a worldwide, we have that. A lot of the games are played by uh, by the employees on their smoke breaks. That's you know that's what killed touchscreens, if you would, because you know, that's who played the touchscreens. The employees on their or one of the people who did uh, drunk driving laws. Obviously, a good thing. People don't go out as much. That's why we have home entertainment and so many other technologies, uh, new entertainments. You know, uh, downloading video. Uh, um, it's, what do you call it on TV when you can watch a show that's long gone? Um, demand? D yeah, yeah. Demand. Uh, I'm, I, it's like I really watch all this stuff. Um, uh, you know, all the different things. And, and the biggest thing, Lyman, Lyman Sheets, uh, you know, said to me, well, when, when he was in college, he'd go get a, pick up his pizza and 
he would uh, uh, play the video game or the pinball machine when he was there. Now the kids go to pick up their pizza and they're on these, you know, doing things you know, with these. So we're competing with a lot of different stuff, not just pinball, <coughs> all coin up. So, you know, we've lost locations and people aren't out as much as more home stuff, but all coin up. So, you know, the volume today is different than the volume was then. But then again, you know, we may, we're a lot smaller company and have geared ourselves and we built ourselves to deal with this, this, this business. We love it. This is what we do. Again, I'm 66. I could retire. But uh, thank you, Gary. You're welcome. Okay, oh, he's, he's getting get ready. I can tell it's getting all, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Well, Gary, in your generation and mine, you know, there was no such thing of, you know, downloading yeah. something, you know. And uh, there's, there is stuff that you cannot download. You cannot download, like, the feeling of being in a surfboard of, or going out with somebody and playing pinball. I'm, I'm a big gamer fan. And uh, still the video games recreation of machines, they cannot like really uh, compare to each other. So I'm not gonna say anything. I just gonna give you, you know, I, I have to say thank you for being so many years, still bringing like, I, I one time I said, you know, why, uh, why there are no more machines coming up of movies? And then I saw Avatar. <laughs> And then I saw Iron Man, and then I saw Tron, and then I saw stuff. So, you know, the stuff that you do, it cannot be downloaded. And right now, all my world is falling apart because it's available on the internet. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> Books, movies, dates. You know, I hope we don't have to eat through the internet either. But, <laughs> you know, the only thing I can tell you, it's the thing that you bring us, it cannot be downloaded. It cannot be copy it. So just keep doing what you do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and you all, all right. keep doing what you're doing because you're the ones who make, make, it, make it possible for us to, to have pinball machines. I do, I do agree with them. Um, I just want to thank you also for making pinball machines still. I know that you could probably take your equity and make more money elsewhere. So I do appreciate that. My question is with the uh, Tron LE. How do you determine to make 400 machines? And uh, congratulations on selling them out. I know it might not be sold out yet for distributors, but if it does sell well, what do you do if there's a more demand for it? Can you remake more? Are you going to upset those people? Um, so we we st we have made uh, limited edition games. Uh, first one was Elvis Gold. We made 500, not 501. We announced 500. But that's what we made. Um, we made Spider-Man Black. That was 500. We announced 500, that's what we made. Dale was limited edition, as I remember. Whatever we said we were gonna make is what we made. I think it's 250, I don't remember. We, we, when we say a number, it's sacrosanct. We do not violate it. We don't make one extra game. I don't have one extra game in my apartment or anything like that. The number is the number. How do we get to the number? <laughs> 400. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Hey Gary, I, I want to thank you for Tron as well. It's a game that I've always wanted to make. If I was ever going to make a home-based game, that's what I would have done. And uh, I think it's a great thing that you did. Um, when he was saying you that you can't download the experience, I kind of somewhat have to disagree. And I, I brought this up earlier with uh, Jersey Jack that there's a lot of a lot of people out there who can't afford to buy a pinball machine. Um, certainly, they can't own 12 in their house. Um, and then there's there's a lot of people who play the virtual pin uh, either on their PC or on the Xbox or the Wii, and it's actually been a really popular game. I think it's one of the best titles on the Wii as far as like the all-time rated games um, for the Williams. And I was just wondering, I there's kind of a rumor out there that that you've been against releasing the the ROM sets and stuff for your games. Um, would you ever be, consider selling them or uh, making them available so that more people could play your games and potentially, if they're enjoying them on the screen, they might enjoy them even more in real life. 
First of all, a lot of, a lot of the games can be played on the computer having nothing to do with our authorization. It's uh, MAME or something like that is called. Uh, so they do exist. Um, without our software, uh, to emulate these games, you don't need our software, uh, our source code and, and so forth. Um, as far as us authorizing or working with somebody, it's a possibility. Uh, it's, you know, it's something we've talked to somebody about who's in that business you know, some time ago. Our games are mostly licensed titles. That, so therefore, the permission to do it, we can give permission for what we own, which is our trademark and the game design. The licensor owns the rights to Tron, what have you. So they have to say, okay, you know, we're, we'll do this. Well, most of these guys are licensing us as a little piece of their business, and licensing video is a big piece of their business. <coughs> as far as the source code, no, we're not going to ever give anybody our source code. That's our source code. It's got our secret, secret, you know, uh, handshakes and cookies and whatever and mysteries and everything in it. And you just don't do that. You can't. You can't. It, it's too risky to do that, not just for somebody making pinball machines, but somebody taking our source code, playing with it, putting something in the game that the licensor sees and is offended by or didn't approve, and no. That, that, you know, the second most important group of people to me, first most, is our player customers, okay? Most important in bars and in, in wherever, you know, and, and in your homes. Second most is our licensors. I treat them with the greatest respect and with kid gloves and what have you and take great, great care. Nobody, no licensor has ever been disappointed in a product that Date East, uh, Sega, Stern, Pinball have made. None of them will. Now, as far as not being able to afford to buy a game at home, great. Go to Shorty's. That's sure. what they're all about. Sure, but there's a lot. There's a lot of. I mean, I'm, that's great. I agree. I mean, I I'm one of the I people. I didn't mean that, to be a wise. No, I'm, I'm one of the people that has games at Dorky's, for example. Yeah, yeah. And great. so, um, you know, I completely agree with with pretty much everything you've said today. I I totally want to support pinball, but there is this generation of kids that are coming out that they're just stuck on their Xboxes. They're stuck on their Wii's, and and it's been proven and, that they enjoy playing these games. And if you can, if you could just consider in the future when you're getting these licenses trying to make that that you guys get the rights to make a pinball version they, they, of the vi video game they won't they won't do that with it they're, they're gonna do that maybe separately in very rare cases in some cases, I've had licenses where okay you can make the pinball machine subject to EA's approval because they've licensed EA you know the big the big bucks are out there they're not going to give us the video the video rights to it they might do it on a case-by-case -case ba basis it's just a real world uh, you know what it's about um, but you know it's like you want to go boating. You don't own a boat. You rent a boat. You take your girlfriend or your wife out in the boat, you know, you have, and you rent a boat. You want to play pinball. You don't own a pinball machine. You rent the pinball machine for three minutes with 50, 75 cents. And that's really what, what it's all about. We're renting time. We're selling time on the pinball machine. We're selling fun. Because if they're not fun, what's the point? They're not, these are not heart lung machines. They should be fun. You know, we don't take ourselves too seriously. But you know, that's, that's, that's why we need games and locations. So the kids, we need games and locations. That the, is, you know, the 19-year-old goes in a bar. I'm assuming he's, you know, he's you know, an all-American kid. He's got a phony ID. So he goes to the bar. And he's gonna, you know, he's gonna, he goes there to meet a girl, but he's afraid to talk to the girl, so he's gonna play a game. If we give him a pinball machine that is pure skill, he plays for 35 seconds, he looks like a piece of junk, and just embarrasses himself, and there goes the girl, he's never gonna play, play a pinball again. We gotta let him have fun, which is capital F, capital U, capital N, have fun for that 75 cents, and he'll, he'll, Slowly, one at a time, you guys do IFPA stuff and do, do uh, leagues that are, you know, you start, your, you bring your league to a, to a bar, put, you know, put seats in the stools, and then start a, what do you call a lower, you know, a beginner's league or something. What do you guys call this? Novice, thank you, a novice league. You know, get some other people involved. That's how we're gonna get pinball to exist. Gary, Gary I, 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 I 100% agree. It's great to get people out and playing the real games. I just, please, uh, 
everybody here, I bet you, owns an Xbox or a Wii or a PlayStation 3. Everybody in this room probably owns one. And, and I guarantee you, 60% of the kids out there in the world, if not more, are, have a game machine at their home. And, and if you want to introduce them to pinball, please just consider it in the future. We're, we're negotiating with somebody you know, who wants to do it. I just don't, I think they're going to be able to do the old Stern games before they can do the new Stern games because the old Stern games, with the exception of Meteor and uh, Nugent and what have you, weren't licensed titles. They, you know, they're, they're free. They just belong to, to us. But that's true. That's true. That's true. That's one of our, that's one of, Time, time Machine, Time Machine. We have a couple, we have a couple on licensed titles, not many. We don't. I, I just, I totally believe in licensed titles, which I can explain to you. If you want to go ahead. You first. <laughs> um, on that note, I was kind of curious with all the work on licensed titles, if there's any pent up interest, designs, or brainstorms in the bowels of your design shops and no. your artists for doing an original title. They would like to, and I wouldn't. Um, but then again, <laughs> nothing is nothing is cast in, you know, this, that's a decision that's cast in cream of wheat, not in concrete. <laughs> but no. And the reason I say no, and that's the perfect timing, <laughs> what does a license title do for us? It does a lot of things. First thing is it puts our people in touch with other creative people. Um, you know, Seth MacFarlane gave us a couple hours of speech in Family Guy. Uh, uh, the Simpsons people did the artwork on Simpsons. Uh, the the um, um, South Park people did the artwork on South Park, and then the South Park people rejected their own artwork. <laughs> no, never mind, but that's true. That's true. Um, but things like that. You know, it gives a. a Listen, why was there a ball-eating dinosaur in Jurassic Park? Because it was Jurassic Park. Crichton knew that this was a hot topic, you know, a hot, hot genre to, to make his, the, the book he was writing and later a movie about dinosaurs, because dinosaurs were hot. We could have made just a dinosaur game, wouldn't have sold like Jurassic Park. When I go to call a customer and I say, I've got an unlicensed game, they say, you know, the Frenchman says, good, send me two, I'll test it. When I call and tell them I've got Tron, he buying. When I call and tell them I got Avatar, he says, send me two containers, I'll take a half a million dollars worth. Sight unseen, okay? Now, Tron, we make because you want it, and you all bought sight unseen, the, the limited edition. But I sold, you know, a lot more games than that because I got a licensed title called Avatar. It's, it, and we gotta keep the money rolling. Again, we're not designing one game a year and then having a factory run for one game and lay everybody off or something. We have to feed that hungry mouth every day. That hungry mouth is, is the mouth of our line workers and their small children and everything else. You know, you look out and say, well, I better, better build something today because you know, they, they have to. So licensing just gives us Hey, listen, you know, these doctors and lawyers who are buying games online or something, do you think they're playing it before they buy it? No, they're looking at the title. Oh, Rolling Stones, cool, I think that'd be good. You know, it just, if you make a stuffed animal that's shaped like a mouse, you're not selling it unless you pay Walt. <laughs> and then you'll sell them. It's that simple. It's, it's just, and licensing was created the whole business of licensing of what we have was created by uh, George Lucas with Star Wars. And what happened was, after the first Star Wars movie, which I saw in the movie theaters when it came out because I'm 66, um, after the f first Star Wars movie, uh, Lucas goes to see Ladd, who's the head of the studio, and says, well, you owe me X number of bucks, blah, blah, blah. And he says, I'll tell you what, just give me all the ancillary rights. Lad calls his, you know, business people. Say, oh, we don't sell much, of them, you know. What a billion dollars later, <laughs> you have a licensing business, and it's and Star Wars, and he really created the license. The week after next, I will be in Las Vegas at the licensing show. It's a mammoth show just based on licensing. All the movie companies are there, so forth. This is this is the world today. You know, we're kidding ourselves to think anything else. We're, we're, Guys, we're not heart lung machine, we're pinball machines. We're not the leaders of the world like we might have been once and like video games might have been once. We're, we're gonna follow the trend and what's going on with it. So 
Yes, guys would like to do a, an unlicensed game. Shelly, who works with me, was, was, can, can we do an unlicensed game? Working with a licensor, and those of you who heard Jack talk, he had an easy one. That's the easiest license you could buy, and really an easy one to work with, because Warner, Warner is sweet. You don't know, it's a lot of work. When we did Batman, the first Batman, we had to do uh, Michael Keaton's uh, jowls over and over again because he thought they hung down too much. We did Kim Basinger's legs nine times <laughs> until we got them to her approval. I don't know whose legs they were then. And Jack Nicholson wouldn't approve anything because he was depressed somewhere in the south of France. Nobody knew where he was. It's difficult. It's difficult. Thank you. Um, no, we've yeah, considered it, yes. No, we don't have any plans to. Um, and other people on, you know, have some rights to those, those titles. But if we made a Williams Old game, just one second here. If we made a Williams Old game, it wouldn't be the Williams game. We have different pop bumpers, different sound system, different flippers, different this, different that. Yeah. And we use our parts, huh? <coughs> Yeah, yeah, but it'd be a different game. And then you guys would say, eh, it's nowhere near as good. And by the way, it probably would, it'd be different. But I, I did ask years ago, I asked my French customer before it was such a collectible, you know, should we make more, uh, this, well, this is six, eight years ago, more medieval madness. Now again, they're 10% of my market. Should we make more medieval madness? Well, yeah, that's a great idea. Then he called a couple of his customers and they said, their operators said, we have enough medieval madness. We bought it then, we wouldn't buy any more. So it'll be, be a collectible game. Kind of leading on. And, or, and I need all three legs of that stool. Maybe linked to, to licensing, merchandising. So I'm looking at your shirt. I'm, I like it. If it was for sale here, I'd buy one. Ah, well, go on our website, www.sternpinball.com, and you can buy most of our stuff. This particular shirt you can't buy, okay. but you can buy the others. The reason you can't is there. There you go. Turn around. So thank you. Hey. Nice, nice. nice. Um, the reason these, yep. these shirts we make to wear at trade shows, and it's just, this is just a Brooks Brothers shirt. Okay. Okay, with a logo on it. I like Brooks Brothers shirts. But I mean, I'd love to come here and see a T-shirt, which is like Stern Tron. We have, a, we, we, well, we don't have it with game names. Right. And that, you know, again, that gets you back to licensing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, do you, do you guess, have the right to do that or not? And then, right. you know, so that, Stern that's something. Tron, like this. We'd have to, we'd have to seek that out. Do uh, it. Uh, <laughs> I'd buy we it. Do have, we do yeah. have Stern T-shirts. We have Stern polos. We got yeah, Stern yeah. hats. Stern, I don't know. Stern, yeah. Stern Key Oh, just t shirts. Oh, yeah, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, buy, yeah. Buy a raffle ticket. We have so online, you raffle. get everything. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else, folks? Just since you brought up the, you know, the licensing has come up, um, what about kind of like everything that you said and just kind of turn a 180 on that? You know, the old story of the monkey that has its uh, hand in the coconut and won't let go of the banana because, it, you know, when you have. I, you know, I work at a major studio and, and, and I understand, you know, all the rounds of revisions and everything that you do. You'd probably save some money and uh, save some things and be able to try some different things if you, you know, did that one thing. Now, of course, yeah. you're not able to go to that French distributor and say, hey, I have a new vampire thing. It's no theme, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'll take two. I'll try them out. But out of 20 machines, to have one, to have your designers to go ahead and say, hey, here's the one where we're going to cut loose. This one's more for the pinball community. And it might be the next uh, uh, medieval madness or something like that. I, and and the, the, yeah. the example I always go back to is like, you know, Hangover was not a success, you know, until they try something different. And, you know, sometimes, you know, kind of getting into that licensing thing, and I agree with you, that is kind of the way of things, but the studios surprise, surprise themselves on a regular basis by uh, doing something a little bit different, not completely different, and then find out that they made more money than they ever could have if they're not giving the money to, uh, you know, Siegel and, you know, those you know, guys. Um, again, I'll take my question um, offline. Uh, <laughs> again, I, you know, we let our guys that do pretty much, and the studios don't bother, the licensors don't bother us as to the game content as much as the art and so forth. And often they have good ideas. Often they add to it. Um, you know, within a budget, and we, we, we have to have a budget, our guys pretty much create whatever they want to create. You know, are as creative as they want to be. And if you look at the stuff that's coming out, I've seen what Steve's working on. I mean, licensed or unlicensed, this is great stuff, okay? Now, unlicensed game. 
I'm going to give you a, a semi-example of an unlicensed game recently. A semi-example. Eugene says to me, I'm not sure this is such a great title for you, Buck Hunter. As far as the Europeans are concerned, it's an unlicensed game. And it doesn't sell through. They don't want it. Now, the Europeans will tell you, oh, we're not Americans. We're not in the marketing. It's only the game that counts. But give me Avatar, all right? <laughs> um, I, we're not a big enough business to take that risk. We need each one to work. The, the trick is to get a good license, and some of them are better than others. I got to tell you, some of the licenses we have I had were not that good. We just needed to get something to keep moving. Well, we're not doing that anymore. We've, now we've got you know, a breathing time and a, and a way to, you know, to get some and so forth. So you know, we're, we're, we're in better, sh better shape in that respect. Good license is, 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 is a great license is fantastic. A good license is really good. A fair license and no license is not so good. Does give the designers you know, four corners of design within. Yeah. Yes, sir. 10 years from now, would a Tron owner be able to buy a replacement play field? Like Good question. New, new old stock items? Good question. We, you know, there are guys who specialize in the, in the older stuff, and we, uh, we um, um, try to be sure that they have, uh, have them. We stock for X number of years. Uh, some of our contracts have limitations on how long we can sell. Sell, uh, sell it. I, most of Williams' contracts did not. The, it becomes a point where it's just not practical to keep making them. Uh, so, what what some people do with something like a playfield is some of the uh, we, when we get near our life, we're gonna we tell some of these parts houses, now's the time to buy buy some and stock them so they do they do exist. Um, as far as us stocking them, 15 and 20 years from now, it reaches a point where it's just. It, it not, we, we're in the business of making new games and supporting them. We're really set up with a parts business to support operators, and you know we're still playing with how do we support everybody else, including operators, you know, uh, with it. But well, once you bought the license, it would be possible 10 years from now to fire up the press room and print off more playfields. Uh, some licenses have time limits. I cannot make Tron in 10 years from now. I can make Tron for two years. I can make parts longer than that, but not necessarily forever. But no license that you buy is open-ended. Uh, nobody gets a license to make a Tron pinball for the rest of their life and their children's life. There is a time limit. And, it, and it's, uh, sometimes that applies to the replacement parts that include their IP. It wouldn't apply to replacement parts ever that don't include their IP as their intellectual property. It wouldn't apply to ramps, for example, but it comes a point where you have to say it's time to retire the manufacturing of this ramp because we're gonna get a demand for two and it's just not practical to make that. So you know that's why a lot of guys will buy a spare play field and they'll buy it in the beginning when they buy the game. So is that something that you offer to customers on the website? Um, I mean, how would you no, get Right that? now, our, our parts are either through parts houses or our distributors. Will we one day offer parts on the website direct? And, and, and Mike's in here listening. We will one day, probably. We're not prepared to do that, but, but not at the same price. The distributor gets it so he can sell it to you for the same price. The reason we would do that at all is that, is that the, the parts stocking in the game industry is not particularly great, so they have to order it from us anyways. So uh, do you make more play fields? Oh, yeah. We have, oh, no. We have play fields in stock for oh, most okay. of the games right now. Absolutely. Right. Oh, yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. It, back glasses, play fields, butyrate sets, all that kind of stuff. We're being thrown out. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, just thank you for coming today. And uh, uh, thank you for our Iron Man. It really hit a home run, I thought, on that game. It, Thank you. My wife and I really enjoy it, and for her to like any game is a real major accomplishment. Because you know, I, that's a, but but you make a real good point again, and that is so many of you have games at home that your kids won't play with you, that your wife won't play with you, that aren't fun for anybody but you, because it's 45 minutes of them watching you and 45 seconds of them playing, followed by another 45 minutes of them watching you. <laughs> And guys, you're just not that interesting. Yeah. I, I'm not. <laughs> Actually, I think you are because you had the right comment. And, uh, I was just wondering if, if you ever came out a machine that you really had high hopes of and 
thought you were going to do really well with it might have bombed and you just kind of scratched your head and thought, how the hell did that happen? And, um, and maybe vice versa, one that you didn't think would do that well and maybe did really well, like, you know, like maybe did, did you anticipate South Park being as, as successful as it was? And I love all my children. <laughs> <laughs> And I love you all for supporting pinball and being interested in it. And do um, you got any more? If you don't, I That's talk. it. Then, then thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And thanks for playing our pinball. <laughs>